Michael, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So today's episode is a little bit different. The format is going to be more of you and I talking with each other. Um, and the topic came up kind of last minute, but I think it would be a really good one for people to hear. Um, and it's how we bought our first, uh, I guess, properties. I was going to say condos, but I can't even remember what your first place was. But really, it's a conversation about how we got into real estate from the purchasing side. Um because I've heard a lot of chatter, really a lot of chatter for a long time, but specifically lately about how buying your first home is is close to impossible. Um, how things are so expensive, people comparing their rent, you know, prices to a purchase price. Um, and you know, as a quick side note, I plan on doing an episode of rent versus buy to to really get into that for people down the road. But um, but we both have unique stories about how we got into real estate and really the things that we use to help propel us to get future real estate, um, which has been awesome because now we both live in homes that we're very happy with and that, you know, I may not even be our forever homes, but they are definitely a longer, a longer term home that we've been in. Um, and yeah, anyway, so thanks for coming on and doing this show with me today. I think it will be really cool for people just to hear how we, how we, our journey started. Yeah. I mean, and actually it's funny because my first condo that I bought years and years ago was actually how I got interested in real estate because I had a fantastic realtor. She was lovely, but um, I ended up doing most of the work and I fell in love with the hunt, the chase, the look, you know, looking at houses and, and that sort of thing. But that kind of got me interested in, you know, pursuing or re-pursuing or kind of <laughs> reconsidering a, a career in real estate. Um, but the, you know, my ex and I, we, you know, did not have a ton of money. We both worked in a retail environment. I was managing an Apple store at that point. He was working at a different Apple store. There was no commingling. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, wanted to buy a condo and, um, you know, he was the very practical one with money and he was like, okay, well, we need to get like 20% and all this stuff and blah, blah, blah. And so we went to a lender and talk to them. And they said, no, we have all these great programs. You can do it for 5% down, three and a half percent down, et cetera. And um, our first place was, I think it was just over $300,000 um, in Alexandria in the Park Fairfax area. We got it with a three and a half percent FHA loan. And we proceeded to, you know, pay our mortgage like you normally do, got the, you know, the PMI removed, kept, we refinanced it to get out of the FHA loan, you know, et cetera, and grew it that way, um, put some improvements into it and, and grew the investment um, to where, you know, we eventually were able to get out of it. The funniest story is, is that during the whole process, um, I was on my way to the home inspection, uh, went to go check my phone, looked back up and there was a car there and I totaled Whoops. my car oh my <laughs> on God. the way to my home inspection during my first my first uh home Not buying funny. process so that was uh that was that the that was memorable thing, actually, yeah the lender was like do not buy a new car uh because that'll affect your <laughs> yeah like, but I need a car but um but then fast forward with my my current husband you know we were living at city market at O, which is this at the time it was brand new um luxury apartment building and we were paying $4,200 a month. We had a beautiful, you know, apartment with floor to ceiling windows. And it was like 1,200 square feet. And we were just going, we're spending so much money on rent. And I was a realtor. I was a, I was a realtor at the time. Um, and I said, like, this is ridiculous. The amount of house that we could own for $4,200 a month is crazy. And so what we did is we found a much more reasonable one in den, I think it was like 800 square feet at 12th and U. And we lived there for eight months. And the money that we saved between the the two rents um, went towards our down payment on our, on our last condo that we ended up renting out. Um, but yeah, and that was a $500,000 condo. And we were able to save up the down payment on it in eight months because of the just the difference. So it was like that one cut that I think I think helped like the, yeah. the one difference that yeah. we made. So yeah. and it then, was a panty dropper apartment too. It was pretty <laughs> sexy. <laughs> and so then, and then you bought the condo, right? The next, then the we bought the that, condo. Okay. So this is the, the part of the story that I find kind of interesting because I've seen one, I've seen that place, but so you saved a ton of money. So as a quick summary, you bought a first place 
FHA loan. We'll get to back to FHA loans in a bit because people crap on them all the time. And then you moved into a very expensive rental, moved into a cheaper rental, saved money, and bought the condo that we're about to talk about now. Yep. Okay, go. Um, and then we, you know, kept that for about 16 months. And then we ended up again with 5% down buying our current house. And um, the thing is, is that like, I have, and I think I've said this on this podcast a few times, but I've never bought a house for more than 5% down um, with the exception of my vacation home, because you can't buy a vacation home without more than 5% down, but it helps, you know, you just, you start with that FHA loan and that $300,000 condo. And I can guarantee you that $300,000 condo, because it's yours, um, is going to be better than any apartment you can get no matter if it is at city market though, and it's beautiful, but then you take that money that you make there, you put in maybe a little bit of work and, you know, improve the value or just the value grows. And then you take that money and it kind of snowballs and it makes it so you can buy that next, that next house and that, that next house and that next house. Cause I move every two years. So, <laughs> but yeah, well, I mean, I think it's important because we're in real estate, right. And we talk, when we talk with other people, you and I are younger in real estate, you know, you're in your thirties still. I just turned 40. Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I think sometimes real estate agents can be seen as like, you know, it, well, in your case, you own a couple of properties, like you, you know, like you just, no one knows the story, right? They just know, yeah. you know, you own this, you've got a rental, you've got a, you know, you've got a yeah. summer home. But the fact is it all started off with an FHA loan of a place in Park Fairfax that was about in the, what you said, low $300,000 range. Very low. Yeah. Right. And it speaks to a general feeling and thing that I say to people who kind of come at this whole process is saying like, it's impossible to get into. It's like, it's not impossible you have to make smart choices and decisions and you have to like your one of the smart choice decisions you made was even though you loved your city market at O place and individually you and your husband were paying a manageable amount for you at mm -hmm. the time, that was a silly way to spend your money when you knew you were going to be here for a long time. You knew you're going to be in DC. And so you knew that you could put that into something that you could own and that would grow value. Right. Yeah. And you decided to save that extra money by moving from expensive rental to a less expensive rental, but it could yeah. be you. Well, I'll, I'll spare everybody my diatribe on, on what I did until, until we get to my story. But, uh, <laughs> but no, my, my, my point is people, I don't think understand how we got to this position. And the way we obviously talk about real estate when we're with our clients is very factual, very knowledgeable because we're dealing with real estate day in and day out. We're dealing with a lot of people who maybe don't know real estate. They've never bought a house or they've never bought one here. And so I think understanding as a client that we as agents went through the same process or processes at some point is is good, right? It humanizes us a bit. Um, so people kind of understand like, you know, I try to say to my clients a lot, like, no, 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 I have been there, right? Like, I get it. I know that this sounds crazy or whatever, but you know, this is the market yeah. or this is how it works or whatever. And the thing is like, neither me or my, my ex, certainly that about my first condo with my current husband, we didn't have like any kind of like family members or like untapped resources. Like it was on us to figure out like, do we take one less vacation? Like, it, it, you know, there was definitely some sacrifices along the way, but the thing is, is that that was able to put us in a position to do this thing that was much more financially freeing so that we can take those vacations and we can, you know, do those things that we sacrificed then um, and do them now, I guess. Um, so, or, and, you know, it wasn't like, you know, we still did our, the things, you know, we still went out, we still, you know, went on vacation. We just didn't go to like, you know, amazing, beautiful vacations. We went to Rehoboth. You weren't going to Bali. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I'm still going to Bali for a very long time. That's that's a while away. Bali actually ends up being part of my story, so I'll, so maybe we should get into mine. Um, do you have any any um, lasting kind of things to tell anybody before we move on to my how I purchased story? No, we covered it. Okay, except this is basically how most of our phone calls go. So if you ever want an insight into how uh, <laughs> our phone <laughs> conversations are when Alice and I get on the phone, this is they're it. never ending basically, and we just. <laughs> Talk and talk and talk now. Um, okay, so my story. So my story is is kind of interesting. So I started off in a place like you, Michael, with an ex. Um, we were renting a place that was pretty affordable in uh, Arlington. 
And I got, we got a knock on the door one day of somebody saying, Hey, we're here to check at the house. And we were like, Hmm. And turns out our landlord had put it on the market, had told us, um, which is a whole well, set of things we could talk about. But, um, and it just so happened that we were kind of going through some stuff and deciding should we stay together or not. And that ended up being one of the nails in the final nails in the coffin, just kind of being like, okay, well, we've got to make a decision. And we decided it was, we weren't right to, you know, whatever we broke up fine. And at the time I was working downtown DC, 23rd and M and I was like, okay, life's a little bit not great right now. Right. Like I want to make my life as easy as possible. I have a weird work schedule. So I rented a place a block and a half away. Like the idea of waking up, literally rolling out of bed, you know, I worked at a gym at that point. So making, I make sure I have like my uniform stuff on, but I didn't have to like look all, you know, did up. That sounded great. And I was spending, I just found my old lease actually from this place. I was spending $19.95 and this is 12 years ago. So it's a lot of money, right? But I had been saving, you know, from living in the cheap place uh, with my ex. And I was like, I just want my life to be easy for a year. That was a decision I made. And so I moved there and about a couple months in, they had sprayed the trash chutes for like regular pest control. And I will spare you guys the details, but the building had a massive roach infestation to the point where I was waking up and they were in my bed. Oh, Jesus. It was awful. It was really awful. And also, and by the way, talk about experience with like property managers and real estate agents at th- that time in my life, I was convinced that like there was nobody who could really help me in that industry because the property manager was so awful to me. But anyway, so I'm like literally sitting in my bed, sans cockroaches that I've gotten rid of at that point, like crying. And I you know, call my dad and I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, I can't stay here. The property manager is telling me I have to stay here because I have a lease and I didn't understand my rights or any of that kind of stuff. You know, I was like, I've already put every grocery I own in the refrigerator, like, you know, anything, literally, like pasta in a box in the refrigerator. I'm afraid, like, you know, I'm going to draw the cockroaches to my place. Um, And my dad was like, Allie, spending that much per month, why do you just not buy a place? And it literally had never even dawned on me. I didn't think I could do it on my own. I didn't Mm -hmm. think I had the money. I didn't, I knew I didn't have the down payment. I certainly had been like spending a lot of the money on this crazy expensive rental because that was a decision I thought was important for me at the time. And, um, and a couple of fortuitous things did happen. Obama had done the first time homebuyers tax credit and you could actually kind of, I ended up purchasing, um, in March of 2009. Um, my accountant was able to take that tax credit and put it on the previous year's tax returns when I did them. So effectively, I also got an FHA loan, 3.5% down is what it is. It was like $290,000, I think, my my condo. Was it the perfect condo I want to live forever? No. It was a lower level, one bedroom, 500 and like 30 square foot apartment. It was new. It was new construction because I knew I could not afford to redo an HVAC or redo or get a new washer and dryer or really any of that. Right. It's like, I need things to be new and under warranty and and all of that. Um, and, um, and I didn't even have, I mean, as maybe as this sad or pathetic as it sounds like I didn't even have the 3.5% that I needed to also make sure I had enough money to deal with any kind of emergencies. Right. Like I had a car, I had a Mm -hmm. dog, I had things that needed money. And so I was very lucky my parents said, we're not gifting it to you, but we will loan that. And then when I got the, the tax credit back, I paid my my parents back. And that's how I got into my first condo. Hmm. Um, <laughs> and and also it was at the time it was Logan Shaw. OK, and, and people are like, Logan Shaw, you know, like that's the, why are you living there? And I was, and you know, I knew everything was moving east. Like if you kind of have your a pulse on what's happening in the city you live, like you know which areas are growing, right? And right. so, will I, you consult your real estate agent? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so so I ended up, you know, buying a place in March. Um, and I'll sneak the Bali story into here really quick. I had this kind of opportunity to, um, I really wanted to travel abroad. And then I was like, well, now I have this, this condo, like I can't, you know, I can't do anything with this. And, um, and somebody was like, wait a minute, don't you have like no rental restrictions on this building? Why don't you just rent it out? And then it'll pay for it while you're gone. And I was like, okay, well now I still need to afford to be able to travel. Like, how do I save for that? Um, and I found this like house sitting gig 
where I had to take care of this house in Georgetown. There was a bunch of other stuff I had to do, but it doesn't matter for this. And I rented my place out while I lived in the city. So I was living in this crappy rental, like a mile away from my condo that I had just bought and furnished and looked beautiful with stuff mainly from Ikea, but who cares? It looked great. And, <laughs> and I rented it out and that allowed me to travel for the better part of a year. I did go to Bali. I was on a shoestring budget, um, but basically I would had been living for free for the months preceding my trip. All of that money I banked, somebody was renting my place and then I left. And after that point, I probably moved in and out of my own condo eight times, eight times. And the reason is, and this is an important part of my story, is I couldn't always afford it. Mm. I had quit my job to go travel, something that I still value very much. It's a very important part of my life. It was a growing experience. It was, again, it was a decision I made. But even when I came back and I said, okay, my decision is to be here and I want to, you know, I have another job. I'm working. I need to save up my money. It was a sacrifice I made. It was a sacrifice to you know, I, I stopped going out. Like I got my hair cut twice a year, you know, like I started learning how to do my nails myself. And I was like making the sacrifice to save the money back up and get that kind of nest egg back. So I could get back into my place (laughs) and not live with friends or roommates. Um, and, and that, and as that happened, my place grew from being, you know, $290,000 to somewhere in the mid four hundreds. And that happened pretty quickly. So that, you know, it's been priced about the same now for a couple of years because that area of town has had more competition and all the stuff, you know, that we know. Mm-hmm. But um, it grew really, really quickly. I also refied out of the FHA kind of PMI payments you have to pay, which for those of you who don't know is, is, an, is basically mortgage insurance, which you're paying because you don't have 20% down, right? right? Is it 20%, Michael? Right. 20. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I refinanced that out. I got equity in the place. And, you know, now fast forward many years later, I live in a different place with my fiance and Bloomingdale. And, you know, I have that as a rental yet again. Um, and, and what's so awesome is that I went, I love that I went through this experience. Truly, <laughs> I do. Because as hard as it was, I mean, I've always been a hustler. I've always been somebody who works really hard for what I want. But there are times that, you know, I couldn't even be in my own place that I owned. But it was there. And I had made that initial decision to buy and figure out how to make it work. And, you know, that condo now, it's, it's, that condo is never going to be anyone's forever home. It's a lower level, right. tiny one bedroom place. And there are lots of those in the city that, you know, that people need to get their first place and that helps you get your second place. And in your case, it helps you get your third place somewhere else. Right. Um, and so it's, it's from true experience that we speak about, about home buying and how it can truly help, help you. I mean, something that always has stuck with me that you have said, Michael, is that it was a forced savings plan for like when you bought a home. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, because as, as you build your equity, you literally are putting your money into something that, in theory, will never go away. So, like, once you you know sell it, you either take that money and you put it into something else, or you take that money and you put it into your retirement. You know, like that's kind of my long term goal. Is <clears throat> you know, I'm terrible about putting money into my SEP IRA and all of that stuff, but like, I buy houses and then you have to pay the mortgage, otherwise the bank takes it away, and hopefully, you know. 20 years from now, if you talk to my husband, my financial planner, 10, if you talk to me, when I retire, (laughs) you know, I can sell these houses and then that's the money that I'll retire on, you know, and that's kind of forced. Yeah. You have, cause you have to force me to save because otherwise I'll, um, you know, put it into your house to make it look beautiful or spend it on avocado toast and (laughs) (laughs) perfect highlights. Um, Yeah. I mean, the the main takeaway I wanted people to have is I don't think we're speaking to people who are experienced and and have bought several homes before. Mm -hmm. Um, Though I think my little story about how I had to move out at one point to move back in really could apply to anybody. Well, you were scrappy because when you first got into real estate, that's what you did. You're like, okay, this is something I want to do. Like, I'm not going to have a lot of income coming in or regular income. So I'm going to move out of my place. I'm going to rent it out. And, you know, you made it happen. And now, you know, 
You live in a beautifully appointed home, <laughs> as we can all see behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, it's – yeah, I mean I- – I hesitate to sound like, I mean, we're millennials, you know, I think we have friends on like uh, older and younger than us. Like we've got, I mean, it's true. We, we have clients and friends that span all ages. Um, and I never want to be seen as somebody who's like, you know, I know better. Um, or, or for somebody to think I just live in the home I'm in now. And then I just like, like magic into it. Like it was some like easy peasy, you know, thing that I landed in. Mm -hmm. Um, like I just wanted this to be kind of a, a, a an episode for people who are thinking about buying and feel like defeated or feel like they can't to know that you you probably can. And it's just going to take some work, some effort. It's probably going to take some sacrifice. And I'm not saying don't eat your avo- avocado toast or don't get your nails done or whatever that thing is, but you might not be able to do. Apparently, don't go to Bali. <laughs> you can still go to Bali and buy a house. That's everyone's takeaway from this podcast. <laughs> Quit your job and travel for a year, and then you can buy the home of your dreams. That's the that's the takeaway. Um, no, no, no. But you know, like, just choose the things that are important to you, right? And mm. and do them. Um, and go to the really expensive gym, right? Get your massage once a week, like whatever that thing is. That's fine. But you probably just can't do all of it. Like in my case, it was like I'm lucky. At the time, I could do my roots. I was starting to go gray, but I could do it. And my hair looked okay even when it had needed a trim. So, like, I didn't get my hair cut very often. Um, you know, so, and that's what allowed me to really one of the things that helped me get here, literally here in this home where, that I'm in now. So, yeah, I just, um, I hope everybody who's listened today either gets to know you and I a little bit better because I think that's always good for any of our clients, but also, you know, has a sense of... <laughs> has a sense of hope or, you know, um, yeah, feeling that they can, they can get into the market or that they can make it happen really, if that's what they want. And I would say like, even if you feel like you have, you know, two pennies to pinch together and like $5 in your bank account, still talk to a lender. Cause they, they could probably say like, Hey, like if you do this, this, and this mm-hmm. in a year from now, you might be in a position to buy a place. Like they can mm-hmm. really, and you know, we can help you as well, but they may be able to tell you like, Hey, we've got this really great program, or you know, if you do this, you know, mm-hmm. it, there's just there's there's options that they know about that we don't necessarily know about, and they may also be able to say, you know, credit is also a thing for people who are just trying to get in. They're trying to make sure, like, you know, they may not have had a credit card that long or whatever. Um, and a lender can say, like, hey, like, if you pay off this credit card or move this balance to this one credit card, like, they'll they'll tell you like the the financial magic magic tricks that you can do to make it you the best buyer you can be in right. that year from now or the year and a half from now when you're ready financially to buy or maybe you're ready now and you just don't even know it um and they need to tell you how to do it so yeah yeah it's worth the conversation and it's free you know it is <clears throat> yeah and i think that you know making sure that you talk to the right people and i mean I, I caution people about this a lot but that you don't just like watch a 60 second TikTok video or, you know, um, some, well, well, no, I mean, cause information is information and people gather in different ways. So I don't want to poo poo it, but I mean, it's really making sure this is not a 60 second conversation, right. With, which, mm-hmm. with somebody, this is like a, a minimum 10 minute conversation. And that's even pretty quick to go through how all this works and how you can achieve your goals. So if, if having a house in this area is your, is your goal, then, you know, talk to the right people. It can happen. Um, don't crap on FHA loans or things that you might think are, you know, are not good. Everything has its place. Um, and you know, and, and just keep an open mind. Yeah. And the thing is, is that there's, there's lenders out there who have competing products with the FHA loans. So maybe you don't want to get into the FHA loan because it's got the PMI or whatever, you know, da, da, da. you know, there's several banks out there that I know of that do first time home buyer programs Mm -hmm. that don't have that you know the strings attached or the you know the uh additional fees that the fha loan does but i got an fha loan and i did not regret it and i think it was a good program to do and it allowed me to have three point five percent down you know and there's just i think there's you know um there's merits to it but if you don't want to do it there's other there's other programs out there and that's why it's just really important to talk to a lender maybe it's just going to like a first time home buyer seminar and talking to those folks and cuz what i don't want people to do is go out <clears throat> excuse me um is to go out and get you know into this financial trouble you know so we want it to be something right. that they're afford they can afford and that they're you know going to be able to maintain long term um 
So talking to a reputable lender is the most important thing. Um, not just like, you know, Joe's loans or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, but making sure that the, your lender and your agent have your best interests at heart. Um, and it, that may be you're waiting a year and a half or a year to buy it or two years, whatever that looks like for you. Um, but, but there are options out there that aren't the FHA, but the FHA is a very, very good program um, yeah. and something that I think people should take advantage of if they can. Yep. Agreed. Well, I'm going to draw this one to a close, Michael. Thank you for coming on and sharing your experiences with us. Of course, anybody who's listening, if you are looking to get in the market and you want some help, we are able and ready to talk to you about both our experiences in detail and maybe what your experience could look like. So uh, so give us a shout. And uh, Michael, thank you. I'm sure I'll have you on again at some point and I'll talk to you guys all soon. Thank you. 